I've been playing Void Spire Tactics because you have no time to game. Apologies first of all, I've got a bit of a cold, so if I sound a bit weird, it's because of that. Anyway, welcome to the next When the Credits Roll review, a series in which I only review a game once the credits have actually rolled. So you can have some faith, kind of, that I may somehow know what I'm talking about. So anyway, first up, the basic details about Void Spire Tactics. It was released on the 2nd of November 2015 for PC, and was developed by Rad Codex, and it took me just under 20 hours to complete. Void Spire is an interesting beast, one that I wasn't sure I was really going to get into when I started it, but very quickly found myself completely engrossed in what was going on. Story-wise, its overview is quite simplistic. You play as a no-name group arriving at the docks for whatever reason, but after an instant you find yourselves trapped on a floating continent that is an amalgamation of many different areas and people all smooshed together, with no one having any sort of clue what is going on. This smorgasbord of gathering areas creates an interesting mix of biomes, and for once it actually makes sense why you can walk from a snowy plains to a bubbly pink goo land. Well, because magic. Our little dudes have no clue what's going on, and set out to just try and escape. They don't even seem to care that much about what is going on, but obviously through interactions with the denizens and getting yourself caught up in all sorts of shenanigans, you will slowly unwrap the mystery of the spire in your attempt to escape, because that's all they want to do. <laughs> this leads us to our little dudes, and like I say, they are no-name goons. During character creation, you get to choose four little minions, choose their race, and there's some basic features each race has its own little special effect and are quite interesting, as they're not your classic dwarf, elf, etc, but you have bug people, snake people, all sorts, and more to choose from. I had no idea what to make or build, so I just went in blind, and I ended up with Bert, Ernie, Big Bird and the Count as my crew. From creating your characters, how they progress is also very interesting, as there is no choosing your class at the start of the game and being stuck with it. Everyone has access to every class at all times to choose. Well, when I say every class, I mean they do need to be unlocked, but unlocking them is quite simple. You gain XP in the required classes beforehand, and through trial and error, and when you meet the prerequisites, a new, more advanced class is unlocked. And then you get to access and play with it. And you can literally swap them around at any time. And there are no restrictions on any of your dudes can become what they want them to be. So, have fun. Now the classes themselves are also pretty fun. Each class comes with several skills, some of which are support abilities, and you can even dual class, but only your main class actually gains XP. What's cool is you get to use every class, every skill, from either of the classes you've got equipped. So it's just worth unlocking all of them to unlock all the skills. To unlock the skills is super simple. Uh, basically, your XP you gain, can be spent unlocking the skills and then upgrading them. Upgrades usually make the range of the skill bigger or its special effect last longer or do more damage. Like it's it's super simple. Now the classes themselves have many of what you'd expect, such as warriors, rogue, mage types, but it also has its very own void by unique classes, such as the Unmaker, a kind of proto necromancer or the gatekeeper, someone that uses portal magic to unleash big AoE abilities or even teleport around the map. Now, I mentioned support abilities. Each of your little dudes can take three support abilities, which make what makes these different from your normal skills is that you can select from any of the support skills that you have locked for all your classes, not just the two equipped classes. So with the flexibility of the class and support ability, you can create some truly interesting builds for your little goons. On top of this, for every 200 XP you gain in a class, they gain a little star. This can be spent on a third menu under the character menu. Each class has a set of stats it can upgrade using the stars. So this can be as simple as spending one star to gain one HP, or making yourself more effective with certain weapons or elements, or even upping your movement range. So raising a bunch of classes XP can be very beneficial as you get to add all these additional stats. The world of Void Spire itself is very unique. I didn't really mention it before, 
but it's not your traditional fantasy world. It's actually a kind of science fantasy world. So you have swords and magic, but also guns, motorbikes and airships all together. And the Spire's main hub gives you, like, g gave me, like, a post-apocalyptic vibe. And when I say main hub, it's just kind of like a big open space that leads to all the different areas that you can explore. It's also where you find your main goal, as it's basically... Which is basically gather all the parts to fix an airship to get off the Spire. Exploring the Spire is a trip. It gives very classic CRPG style. That you wander around, talking to the NPCs. Some of which have shops, some battle enemies... But has a surprising level of interactivity which I wasn't expecting you can dig the place up looking for treasure if you have a spade mine through walls looking for secret rooms if you have a pickaxe bash rock cut down trees even placing wood to, wood to form bridges you can grow vines to get up walls that don't have any other way of getting up them or even use the gatekeeper's teleport spell to hop around the place you can use skills to burn through rugs and fauna it's Make the floor let wet with water spells and then zap anything with lightning as it walks on the water. Like the game has a surprising amount of interactivity with its items, spells and the map. You even get to watch the areas get messed up from the battle as well, which is quite fun. What's even more fun is the items stay where they are. So if you leave an item on the floor, it will just stay there. Now this is useful as each character has a limited inventory which can be increased after a fashion by finding bags and little boxes and such to carry around in that inventory. But with you, and I get the expanded inventory is important as a lot of the items to collect and lug around. Each character has like two weapon slots, an armor slot, two accessory slots, but you also want bandages, bombs, fire bombs, little elemental gems, and more. <laughs> so yeah, having uh, bags, carrying bags with you is, is really important. And having somewhere where you can just drop items that you might want to use later is also quite useful, knowing that they won't disappear. Eventually, though, we're going to get into battle, and the battle system follows a classic speed-based, turn-based battle system. In that, at the top, you can see a turn order with duration, on which the character is going to act, and on your turn, you get to move and use one of your abilities, or use an item for your inventory. Now, small note, as it took me a silly amount of time to figure this out, if you have a crossbow or a gun, they need to be reloaded between each turn. To do this is quite simple, you just click on the weapon and you'll see a little green square appear over the character, click on that and boom, they'll reload, but it does take an action. Now the interactive I mentioned before carries on into battle as elemental effects combine in different ways. Like if you make a massive puddle then zap it, everything stood in it, friend or foe, will get hit with lightning damage. Or random bones lying around can power up your own maker. And if you have the right support ability. So, while being quite classic grid based tactics, there's a lot of fun and flexibility to it because of the classes and the environmental effects. But beware, friendly fire is definitely a thing. And resources are a little scarce on the scarce side, so plan well. So, what really stood out overall for me is the sense of exploration it gave me from unlocking classes to find out what particularly the weird and wonderful ones do to see what the next area brought as they're all quite different so along with this i really enjoyed the battle system and kind of wish there was more of it as in many cases you only, once you kill a group of enemies they're, they're dead for good only a couple of encounters re actually respawn so there's not too much grinding so i've gushed about what i liked but as with everything there are some negatives i can see some bouncing off this game due to the visuals it's not the most spectacular even for a pixel art game and the game itself could be a little bit obtuse about things like how i said it before it took me a while to figure out how to reload or how best to look for secrets and the fact that there is so much hidden stuff could well turn off the completionist type there's even a look feature which can be used on things to update your journal i mean by the end of the game i'd only unlocked 38 percent of the journal so there's a lot of little fiddly things to do which might put some people off i would usually break up the metacritic score at this point so, uh, yes this is yet another game that has fallen to the tactic genre curse of being overlooked and not having enough critic reviews to get a metacritic score so on to my final thoughts 
Void to Buyer Tactics is a definition of a hidden gem. Rad Codex has created something truly wonderful with this game. So wonderful, literally, as the credits rolled, I downloaded the next game from him. Anyone that enjoys CRPGs, tactics, or turn-based RPGs, you should really give this game a chance. So my final rating is must play.